ladies and gentlemen, it's William Bell. Welcome to All Things Fulfill. And uh, in this video, we're going to do a second version of Roundabout Eschatology. Now, I know that uh, many of you have sent comments and made uh, remarks about how much you enjoyed the videos that we did with Daniel Rogers uh, working together as a team. And we certainly enjoyed it ourselves. We had a lot of fun. We spent uh, about a week together. Uh, because he was here for the South Haven Power Lectures that we attended. And um, during the time off, you know, between playing guitars uh, to the wee hours of the morning uh, and uh, making videos is where we spent most of our time and uh, totally just had a lot of fun. And I know some of you have said, well, this is the format that you should keep. But look, I don't have a Daniel Rogers here with me. I would have to adopt both him and his wife uh, and... Uh, bring them here to uh, be able to do that on a daily basis. And so as much as you enjoy having that done, then, um, you know, I don't know how to make that possible at this point. Nevertheless, whenever, you know, he's willing to come back, you know, we can do this. And we did talk about him coming back so that we could do uh, more videos and work on more things together, more projects together, which, uh, again, we certainly enjoyed. So for this point, you know, you're going to have to endure uh, with me for, <laughs> for the time, and we're going to go through this, but I wanted to do these videos, and I know some of you have missed me being on live, and of course I've missed you as well. Uh, I will be back uh, this week to do live videos. Uh, there's also been a, um, a death uh, of one of the preachers in the progressive church, or the preacher in the progressive church who, have, who has been over the years very, very... Uh, supportive and helpful, and we have gone there and preached and helped that congregation, but we've also um, experienced a loss, and uh, I may uh, travel there, and so if I don't get back on, it's going to be because I'm headed um, to South Carolina and then may possibly go to Michigan as well. I'm sort of tossed between the two, but this was very sudden and happened, and um, those of you who know Theo Jenkins and Jana Coleman, and Gary Davis and all, you know that they're tremendous friends of ours and uh, great brothers and sisters. And so we're just uh, torn by the loss of Pastor Joseph and would look forward to uh, talking with them and visiting with them and being uh, with them if we possibly can. So um, that's sort of a pre-announcement on what's going on. But I wanted to uh, continue to make these videos. Um, this is the second uh, in the series. Uh, we've made, we have to cut the first one in two, and I might have to shorten this one a little bit or cut this one in two, but I want to get all the information in. So let's go ahead and begin. We're talking about Roundabout Eschatology version number two. Now, uh, we're going to start out talking about death, being clothed at death. Now, you know they had a couple of presentations at the Power Lectures on death. And again, Dunn and I are going to flesh this out um, very meticulously on our Two Guys in the Bible broadcast. But I'm just basically pointing out some things that refer to uh, roundabout eschatology, to whom shall we go, as we look at positions that have been taken by various brethren uh, over the years to show you how we can arrive at covenant eschatology just by looking at some of the positions that they have taken and that they continually take to this day yet they dishonor us for taking these very positions. Now, here's a statement um, regarding Gus Nichols' belief. Uh, and Gus Nichols, by the way, is the gentleman who debated Max King the year I was graduating from high school back in 1972. Uh, and so Max King is making his third speech, but he makes a comment about the beliefs of Gus Nichols and challenges Gus Nichols to get up in his next speech and deny that this was true. Well, as I read the book, I didn't find any acknowledgement of the statement by Gus Nichols. I didn't find him denying the statement. But I've also heard others who could affirm that this was the actual belief of Gus Nichols. And he didn't get up, as I said, to deny it. Now, Gus Nichols believes... And now the actual quote is, he believes, but I'm inserting his name so that you know who the he is. Uh, Gus Nichols believes there are people in heaven now. If you don't believe that, this is Max talking to Gus Nichols in the debate. If you don't believe that, just ask him or talking to the audience. And if he doesn't believe it, let him get up here and say that he doesn't believe it. 
Brother Nichols believes that all the righteous are out of Hades. They are out of Hades now. And that was uh, on page 99 of the Nichols-King debate. That was King's third speech, um, or third negative speech of the night. And so again, he said, Gus Nichols believes there are people in heaven now. If you don't believe that, just ask him. And if he doesn't believe it, let him get up here and say that he doesn't believe it. Brother Nichols believes that all the righteous are out of Hades. When did that happen? When Jesus died. They're out of Hades now. Now, you got to understand that Gus Nichols was debating Max on when the parousia would occur, and yet he was arguing in the discussion that people had already gone to heaven, even in advance of the parousia. Now, let's see how this turns out for a speech that was made at the South Haven Power Lectures. Don Blackwell, who is an elder and one of the ministers at the congregation, made the following statements on being clothed or unclothed. He says he refers to the resurrected body as a building eternal in the heavens. Now he's commenting on 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which is the text from which Gus Nichols would have drawn his conclusion as well. He refers to the resurrected body as a building eternal in the heavens, but then he speaks of being unclothed. When is this going to occur? So the same question. This is the period between when I die and my soul leaves the tent, my physical body, and the day of resurrection when I get my new resurrected body. During this time, my soul will be unclothed. And then he cites Perry B. Cotham, uh, page, I think the book is Beyond the Sunset, page 265. At the moment of death, the soul leaves the physical body and enters into the Hadean realm. Now, that is 100% opposite to what Gus Nichols believed and what Max King challenged him to get up and deny during that debate. Gus Nichols, just to keep it in perspective, said a person goes to heaven when they die. Dunn Blackwell says, no, that's not true. They go to Hades when they die. They remain in Hades without a body, meaning unclothed, until an alleged future coming of Christ and an alleged end of time comes at which time they will be raised out of Hades, given a new body, and then they are transferred on off to heaven. Well, I hope you can see the problem there. And um, notice, Nichol says this happened when Jesus died. That would place it at the time of the cross, that everyone since Jesus' death on the cross now goes directly to heaven, doesn't go to Hades. But Don Blackwell says they remain in Hades, that we still go to Hades, and that does not end until an alleged future coming of Christ at an alleged future end of time. Well, um, what a dichotomy they have on those two positions. In other words, people are still in Hades and have been in Hades for almost 2,000 years and counting and still no resurrection of the body. But here's the real dilemma of the position that Blackwell has taken. Blackwell's resurrection dilemma is that people are now naked. Now, that's the very opposite of what the Apostle Paul argued for in 2 Corinthians. And it is the reason why. Gus Nichols took the position that he did because Gus Nichols was wise enough to see the problem in 2 Corinthians 5, especially that Paul did not want to be found naked. Well, Brother Blackwell ignores that or just doesn't catch it in the text and then argues for the very thing that Paul said he didn't want to happen to him and that something was given to prevent it from occurring. So this makes it even more complicated. So here we are. As I said, that means according to Dunn Blackwell of the South Haven Church of Christ, Paul and all the saints up to now are found naked without a physical body. 
and without a spiritual body, according to his view. They do not have the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. And uh, because miracles ended in the first century. So no one today can cry, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and in your name done many wonders. That is, worked miracles and signs. That means Will Hanstein's view uh, seems to go by the wayside. At any rate. Gus Nichols was at least smart enough to recognize this. That is, becoming naked, as I said, was a problem. And that's why he said the dead, or the dead ones in Christ, skip Hades and go straight to heaven. Because if they did not, you wind up with Don Blackwell's position of leaving the saints found naked. In Hades, without the Holy Spirit, as a guarantee, and waiting for almost 2,000 years with no sign of Jesus' coming in sight. Now, again, notice, let's just read the text from 2 Corinthians 5. The Bible says, this is verse 2, For in this we groan, speaking of that earthly tabernacle, which he calls the physical body, which it is not. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed, with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, with what? With the habitation from heaven, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, that's the earthly tent, grown, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed. Notice, they did not want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality might be swallowed up of life or by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God who also has given us the spirit as a guarantee, as an earnest. And of course, the reference is to Romans 8.23, the first fruits of the spirit which is a parallel to the text, as well as Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, when he talks about the earnest of our inheritance, which is resurrection, by the way, and the redemption of the body. So the scripture says that he gave the Holy Spirit as the earnest or as the guarantee to prevent being found naked. Do you see the problem that Dunn Blackwell has with his resurrection uh, dilemma. Now, question. Do the people in Hades have the Holy Spirit today or at any time since the first century? That's a question that needs to be answered by these brethren. How can resurrection occur without the Holy Spirit? Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14? He says, and God also shall raise us up by his power. And by the way, I would suggest that you don't overlook the audience relevance with the term us in that text. Because Paul was writing to the Corinthians in the first century when he said that. And they did have miracles. Paul said also that the Holy Spirit was given as a guarantee to prevent being found naked, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 5. And then in Romans 8, 10, and 11, another problematic text for these brethren. But if the spirit of him, that's the Holy Spirit, who raised Christ from the dead, and that certainly was a miraculous spirit, dwells in you. Now look at that statement. If the spirit of him who raised up Christ from the dead dwells, that's present tense, in you, he who raised up Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That's a present tense indwelling of the spirit. It's a miraculous indwelling of the spirit. Now, does Don Blackwell claim that he has the present miraculous indwelling of the spirit? And if he doesn't, I'm wondering why he would claim the resurrection of Romans 8, which affects 
the redemption of the body. Perhaps he'd be willing to defend that in a live public debate, and I would be willing to meet him in that discussion. So there is my public challenge to Don Blackwell to meet me in debate to discuss the resurrection taught in the scriptures according to what he wrote in the end of time 2017 power lectures. The Bible says they had the Holy Spirit. So my question is, who's got the power? When Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, he said, I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. 1 Corinthians 4, 19 through 20. You see, these brethren talk about the kingdom of God would come with power. Show us the power. Who's got the power? And God both raised up the Lord Jesus and will also raise us up by his power. 1 Corinthians 6, 14. Now, in 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8, Paul wrote, Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation or the apocalypsis, that's the same term used, in 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, and also in Revelation 1 and verse 1. So that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting. Now, I know that these brethren are eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord. But have they come short in no gift? Or have they come short in the gifts? I think they've come way short because you know what? They leave those gifts all the way back in the first century. So someone has come up severely short on the gifts of the Spirit. But the Bible says, who will also confirm you to the end. Now, if they want to read end of time in these passages, guess what? It means that men like Dunn Blackwell and all the guys who spoke on that lectureship should have the miraculous gifts until the end of time. And they should not, therefore, have a problem saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? You see, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that they would be confirmed to the end. And they read end of time in such passages that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we've got the apocalypse, we got the end which they generally translate end of time, and you have the day of the Lord Jesus. Well, what's the difference between the end in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 7 and 8, and the end in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 24? You see, there they read end of time, and it simply says, then comes the end, and they say, of time, well, why not read the end of time here and affirm that the miracles continue till the end of time? Because he says he will confirm you to the end. But you see, they understand the problem that they have there, but they can't understand the same problem in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, if Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14 that God will raise us up by his power, and we read in Romans 8, 10, and 11, if the spirit who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, uh, God will also quicken or make alive your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. And you understand that Romans 8 is parallel to 1 Corinthians 15. How can you get a resurrection out of 1 Corinthians 15, which is void of the Holy Spirit? Doesn't make any sense. Paul said they were given a guarantee that they not be found naked. And that was the earnest of the spirit. Let me make a phone call here real quick. Uh, hello? Yes, uh, Dr. Stephen Wiggins, are you in? Hey man, look, it's a long time. Haven't spoken to you since we had our debate in Memphis back in 1994. You remember that? Great, great. Do you remember we had some conversations about the Holy Spirit? Oh yeah, yeah, you know, the, the uh, ones that, you know, you and Bill had a paper on about hammering tongues. 
Right. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, I don't know if you still hold that position or not, but you do know what you affirmed in the debate, right? Uh, do you remember this statement? Let me read it to you. For one, to snatch the passage out of its first century context and slap a 20th century interpretation to it about praying for some imaginary, non-miraculous reception of the Spirit is to do vile injustice to the meaning of the verse. You remember that? Okay, so you do. Now, do you remember when... I took that passage and went to 2 Corinthians 5 and Romans 8, 10, and 11 to show you how you couldn't snatch the resurrection passages out of the first century uh, because that was the prophecy of Joel, which you said occurred in 70 AD. Hello? 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 He hung up on me. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's go on. Stephen Wiggins said, you cannot take a passage mentioning or dealing with the Holy Spirit in the New Testament out of its 20th, out of the first century and slap a 20th century interpretation on it. And we covered this in the first video because all of those prophecies that mention the spirit in the New Testament have Joel 2 as their background. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that creates a tremendous problem for those who are advocating a resurrection that had to be accomplished through the earnest of the spirit. So the question again is, to whom shall we go? According to the Bible, Gus Nichols is correct on not being found naked. He understood that the purpose of resurrection and the Holy Spirit was to prevent them from being found naked. Howbeit, if he places it at the cross, then he gets it before the Holy Spirit is even given, unless he, uh, by the cross, would mean Pentecost. But even then, that's a problem because that is way before the parousia, which, according to, as far as I know, he died believing was still future. According to the Bible, Dunn Blackwell is correct that the new body is received or finished, consummated at the parousia. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Those who are Christ at his coming. But according to the Bible, Stephen Wiggins is correct that the Holy Spirit was only given between Pentecost of 30 AD. Peter cites the prophecy, Acts 2, 16 through 20, pointing back to Joel, chapter 2. Therefore, from Pentecost to 70 AD. And thus, according to the Bible, the only view that will fit all three positions is Christ's return in 70 AD. The saints were not found naked because they had the miraculous spirit from Pentecost to 70 A.D. Micah 7 and verse 15. Christ returned in 70 A.D., opening the way of the holiest of all, so that the brethren could boldly enter into the most holy place. The saints now enter heaven when they die without having to go to Hades. As Revelation 14, 13 says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. That they may rest from, the, from now on, he says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the spirit, that they may rest from the, their labors and their works do follow them. Now, what does he mean by from now on? Well, when you look at the text, he talks about the city of Babylon had fallen. That is Jerusalem, the city where our Lord was crucified, the city that was spiritually called Sodom and Egypt. It's called the great city in the book of Revelation. When that city fell, that's when he said, from now on. And you take that reference, then you see where Hades is destroyed. You see where we don't go to Hades anymore. But now we keep things in context because, as Don Blackwell says, it's at the parousia when resurrection occurs. But also, as Gus Nichols says, you're not found naked. And according to Stephen Wiggins, you're still within the framework of the work of the Holy Spirit, which did not end until that resurrection was accomplished in 70 AD. Now, I understand you don't like it. Perhaps some of the brethren don't like it. But if they are willing to defend it in public debate, and we're, again, issuing that challenge to Don Blackwell. We already have a challenge out to B.J. Clark, um, which we hope he will accept, and, uh, and we will discuss it in live debate.
Now, let's move on. Wayne Jackson responds to miraculous cessation. Uh, so this very argument on 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8 that we showed you in the first round of roundabout eschatology um, with Franklin Camp and Guy and Woods and their positions on 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8, Wayne Jackson takes a different view. And here's what he says. Miracles were designed to confirm Mark 16, 20, or at least this is the argument that was presented to him so that as the argument was presented, he's going to refute the argument. And so let's look at how he attempts to refute the argument. Miracles were designed to confirm Mark 16, 20, Hebrews 2, 3, and 4. And since the confirmation was to continue to the end, 1 Corinthians 1, 8, it is obvious that miracles were to continue to the end, that is, until the coming of Christ. Now, guess what? Jackson says, that's not true. Steve Wiggins says, it is true. Jackson, Gus Nichols said it was true. Franklin Camp said it was true. So let's listen to Jackson's response. The argument is flawed in several particulars, and you can find this on his website, on christiancurrier.com. The purpose of miracles was to confirm the truth of the gospel, Mark 16, 20, Hebrews 2, 3 through 4, not people per se. Yet this passage speaks of confirming Christians. Obviously, the confirmation here suggested it is not the same as these in other texts. Well, the only difference was you got miracles confirming the word in one text, and you have miracles confirming the person in the other text. God always confirmed his prophets. He did that with Moses when he gave him signs. He says, what if the people don't believe me? Then here's... Um, a rod, throw it down, and it turned to a snake. Pick it back up again. Turn back to a rod. Wave it over the water. It turned to blood. Then he tells him, put your hand in your bosom. I might have that a little out of order. And it turned um, white as snow. And then it turned back to its normal. He said, so if they don't believe the first sign, they will believe the second sign. What's God doing? He's confirming his prophet. Believe him because of the signs. Now, Jesus told him to do the same thing. He says, if you don't believe me, remember they charged him with being the prince of devils because he performed miracles. And so he told him in John 10 and verse 37, if you don't believe me, then believe the works. Believe the miracles. That what I say to you is of God. That I am who I say that I am. And that's why John wrote the end of the book, truly many other signs did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe, what? That Jesus is the Christ. You see, those miracles were designed to prove that Jesus was the Christ. That meant they were confirming him. So miracles didn't just confirm the word, they confirmed those messengers of the word. And Jesus was the prophet like Moses. And that believing you might have life through his name. That's why God had to confirm him. So that you would trust him enough to believe that you could receive life in his name. And that life is available to anyone who is willing to accept and obey him. And thus God also confirmed the saints with the signs, with the miracles. Now, response number two from Jackson. The passage no more asserts that miracles will continue to the end of time. Ah, uh, my phone just went off. Sorry about that. Seemed like every time I speak, the phone goes off. And uh, I am too far away from it to get up and turn it off. And so I'm not going to do it, and I just apologize for that. Uh, so the passage no more asserts that miracles will continue to the end of time. Now, see how he inserts end of time in that passage. So it's not like I made it up. He put it there. But what does the text say? It says to the end. And they add end of time. Then it argues the Corinthians themselves would continue to live to the end of time. Jackson inserts end of time. The text says nothing about the end of time. Now, when we were at the South Haven lectures, and I said while I was at the Preterist Pilgrim Weekend, that uh, we were going to go, that Daniel and I were going to go. That was a week before it started, uh, or the weekend before it started. 
And I said, we're going to go there, and I assure you that we're not going to hear a single thing about the end of time as far as establishing it from the Bible. And that's exactly what happened. Now, a couple of men referred to it. They said, well, even though you don't find the end of time in the Bible, it's there. But no one tried to defend it. No, not one single speaker on the entire lectureship attempted to establish and argue for the end of time. Every single one of them, as I said before, stood up and assumed that it was true. They stated it. They asserted it. They never proved it from any logical argument or Bible text that the end of time was in the Bible. They read scriptures that say the end, and even with B.J. Clark on the GBN broadcast, he couldn't bring himself to find the end of time in Matthew 24, 14, so this is what he said, the end, end. So I guess all the passages that speak of the end imply the end of time when if we just say it twice, the end, end. That doesn't work, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing, absolutely nothing. I don't know how many speeches, probably 20 or 30 speeches, a book full of them. No one said a thing about establishing the end of time from the Bible. And that was the theme of their lectureship. All right, Jackson's response number three. The term the end or telos can mean to the uttermost and, not, uh, and so may not have referenced in this context to time as such. The time, the end, can also mean the end of the uh, age of Moses. It can also refer to the day of Lord at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Well, <laughs> hello, it does. Uh, that's what the time of the end means in the New Testament. Uh, we did some, you know, back when I debated Stephen Wiggins, I did some research on this because Steve argued the same thing in the debate. He tried to get around his own uh, position by appealing to the lexicons, and I made several charts. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to put them on PowerPoint, but I think I have one uh, on PowerPoint already, or a couple of them on PowerPoint, and I'm looking through here just to find some of the, the language. But notice, this is on the word heos, uh, until or up to, which is found in 1 Corinthians 1, 7 and 8, and it says it's a, conjunctive, a conjunction, an adverb, um, of time. The first definition given is of time, and that's from the Greek-English New Testament lexicon. Till, until, used also as a preposition with the genitive hells, etc., until when, and then uh, spoken of a limit or term to anything up to the point of, and, uh, and then the last definition I think it gives is one that uh, does not refer to time, which is the one that Jackson preferred, by the way, um, and there is more. Let's see, what else did I have? Because we also went to, um, went to Kittle, and just look at some of the things that Kittle, and this just, just totally embarrassed Steve during the, the discussion. Uh, he says, not all the statements can be arranged with lexical certainty. Sometimes where one meaning is more or less sure, another may be involved too. In the non-prepositional use of telos, at any rate, the context offers the basic sense. Now that's uh, Kittle's theolog Theological New Dictionary, Theolo Kittle's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, volume 8, page 54. He says, in prepositional phrases, which never have the article, the reference is not linguistically to the apocalyptic, that is the terminus technicus, though materially the still-awaited end is or might be in view. One should think rather in terms of non-biblical adverbial use, also attested in the Septuagint. Telos with ace, the most common, hells only in Paul, Acri, Mekri, only in Hebrews, means first up to the end or to the full. The context must decide whether the expressions are to be taken temporally or quantitatively. And uh, Steve Wiggins tried to take it uh, quantitatively. He said it just meant the holy and the fully. That's what he argued in the debate. So we went on, and um, on 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10, We've got a quote from Thayer's lexicon that said, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away, commenting on 1 Corinthians 13.10. He says, Tautelion, the perfect, now this is, uh, you'll see what Jackson uh, said about this in the next, uh, I think it's the next slide, means the perfect state of all things to be ushered in by the return of Christ from heaven. 
Now, they had used Thayer as one of their sources, but they had to abandon Thayer because Thayer did not agree with them. What Thayer said was that 1 Corinthians 13.10 and verse 12, which is the face-to-face -face and the coming of the perfect, is the time of Christ's return from heaven, which equates with 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 6 through 8. And so Thayer and Kittle versus Lockwood and Wiggins, or Wiggins and Lockwood, the Ta Egmaru, or the partial, serves in 1 Corinthians 13, 9, and 12 to denote the situation of Christians in this age. Now, what Kittle and Thayer were arguing was that we have miraculous gifts today. Now, Wiggins didn't believe that. Lockwood didn't believe that. Hammer and Tongues' whole thesis was about the gifts ceasing in 70 A.D., which meant the age of the gifts would have been the pre parousia or pre-70 time of, the, of uh, Christ coming, and that's exactly what they believed. But because these men, Thayer and Kittle, believe the coming is future, then they still have the gifts operative. And so he says, there is now no perfect knowledge, no full exercise of the prophetic gift. No one in the Church of Christ believes that, or at least not few, not many, rather. Though controlled by the Spirit, the earthly existence of Christians stands under the sign of the partial. Only in the future eon will what is partial, ta ek marus, 1 Corinthians 13.10, be replaced by what is perfect. In other words, they say we're still in the age of the partial. We haven't gotten to the perfect yet. That's not the position of the church. And so let's, let's read the conclusion. Here, this is Kittle's conclusion. I'm pulling these straight out of my debate notes um, that I took uh, or created when I debated Steve. The sense of conclusion connects telos with the eschatological events which have yet to take place. At any rate, in the synoptics, now watch this. Don't miss it. <laughs> Don't miss this next phrase. I want to start it over. The sense of conclusion connects telos with the eschatological events which have yet to take place at any rate in the synoptics. Guess what chapters they list? Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. All of which are understood by Wiggins, Lockwood, and many brethren to be 70 A.D. passages. And he adds to that, and this is what put the, uh, the ice cream or the cream on the top. 1 Corinthians 15. You see, Kittle saw no distinction between 1 Corinthians 15, Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. That totally embarrassed Wiggins and Steve uh, in the debate. And uh, so he says, here the context suggests the parousia, especially Mark 13, 7. And parallels also Matthew 24, 14, Mark 13, 21 through 27. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, what they call the end of time, and what Kittle says is Matthew 24. Has in view, and he parallels it with verse 14. Not the end in, but the end. <laughs> has in view the transferring of the Basilea, that's the kingdom, to God by Christ, after vanquishing of the powers with which the conclusion of Christ's work is in fact reached. Verse 28. 1 Peter 4, 7. Remember Hester in the Hester-Preston debate? 1 Peter might, uh, uh, 4, 7 might well have in view the conclusion of all earthly existence. The end of all things is at hand. You know where they placed that? I know where Wiggins and Bill Lockwood placed it in 70 AD. And of course, I agreed with them on that. So you can see, even the lexicons are trying to take the miracles all the way to the end of the coming of Christ because they know they can't cease until that time, but they place it in the future just like some of our brethren. But then they cite Matthew 24 as that end. Whoa, that is a problem. All right, now here's Jackson's fourth response. Later in the same book, Paul contends that supernatural gifts will continue only until the perfect thing. Now he's commenting on 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 10 and 12. The completion of the New Testament revelation comes, 1 Corinthians 13, 8 forward. The apostle does not contradict himself in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 8 and 13, 8 forward. I, I, uh, yes, that's right. 
See, he says he doesn't contradict himself. Well, if he isn't contradicting himself, then whatever 1 Corinthians 13, 8 means, which is gives ceasing in the first century, so does 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8. So Jackson tries to make a hard sell on the perfected thing. His purpose is to steer the reader away from the time of the perfect being equal to the coming of Christ. But he just said you cannot separate them. And by the way, that's a moot point because Jesus is called that holy thing when inside the womb of Mary. Luke 1 and verse 35, if memory serves me correct. The time of the coming of the perfect and the coming of Christ are the same 1 Corinthians 1, 7 through 8, 13, uh, 8, and Kittle, and uh, Thayer, and the Greek New, English Greek New Testament all said that is the case. So there you go with some of those problems. Now, here's what Guy and Wood said concerning the same thing, because we mentioned this. He said, before I take up his charts, this is the Woods-Franklin debate. And I shall, though he has not argued the point at all, let's take a passage here, 1 Corinthians 1, 7, and 8. I do not see the need of going into detail and discussing what the day of Christ is, or of spending a lot of time on this, because whatever the passage means, it cannot extend beyond the lifetime of the Corinthians. They were the ones who were to be confirmed to the end. And it couldn't mean any longer than the end of their lives. In other words, Woods is saying, you can't make this the end end. It has to be the end. <laughs> and besides that, this confirmation was not of the word or of the truth preached. We established that. But of the Corinthians. It has no reference whatever, whatsoever to the matter involved. I think that there is a strong possibility that the day of the Lord here was the coming of the Lord in judgment upon the Jewish nation. Woods Franklin debate, page 201. So ladies and gentlemen, we're not making this stuff up. We're pulling it right from your own mouths. But see, it's got you on that roundabout and nobody wants to get off so they can just stay, um, in fellowship with everybody, even though the things that they say are the exact same things that we're saying when you do it logically, as Gary Workman affirmed. And we'll hear from him later on in the video. Now, here these are a couple of my charts that I have done uh, that I transferred from my debate with Wiggins, and I've now put them on PowerPoint. But one of them is called the work of the Spirit, or at least these two are called the work of the Spirit, and I'll just read them quickly for you. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 28 and 20, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And then in 1 Corinthians 1, which we've already discussed, they would be confirmed unto the end. And we saw how that was parallel from Lexical authorities to 1 Corinthians 15, 24 and Matthew 24. They prophesied in part until the perfect comes, 1 Corinthians 13, 10. They would see in a mirror darkly, but at that time face to face, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. They were children who would become full grown, Ephesians 4, 13 through 14, and also 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and following. When I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. And I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away the childish things. Is the church still a child, or has it now become full grown? And by the way, at some point in time, we're going to talk about the word established. It comes up a little bit later, but I'm going to get into a full discussion on the word established because uh, Drew Leonard has some things in his book demonstrating that he doesn't really understand uh, what that term means in the way that we're using it. And uh, he tries to make a big argument on it, and it just doesn't work. Then he says they had the earnest, or they were sealed, by the way, until the earnest of the redemption, the earnest, uh, until um, they were sealed until the redemption of the purchased possession, which was the earnest of their inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14, which is the redemption of the body. And the earnest 
until the day of redemption, Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And the spirit would be poured out until the great and terrible day of the Lord. That's Joel 2, 30 and 31, Acts 2, 20, Matthew 24, 29, and 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 8. All right, the second chart on the work of the spirit. As we mentioned already, God would raise us up by his power. That's miraculous power, meaning that it had to be in the first century. They knew in part, but they would be known as they were known. We've given you 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Uh, they would understand in part and then uh, would come to the knowledge of, of a perfect man, Ephesians 4, 13 and 14, so that they be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Uh, they had... They were being transformed from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. Uh, they had the earnest of the Spirit as a guarantee so that they would not be found naked. They would not be unclothed so that mortality could be swallowed up of life. That's the Spirit you can't snatch out of the first century and slap a 21st century interpretation on um, because every passage with the Spirit has Joel 2 as its background. And they were waiting through the Spirit for the hope of righteousness. So even the hope, and this is well after Pentecost, Galatians 5 and verse 5, well after Pentecost, waiting for the hope of righteousness through the Spirit. So the only way to get the righteousness, the hope of righteousness, was through the Spirit. And then Paul said, they had begun in the Spirit and therefore were not being perfected by the flesh, and Philippians said, he who has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. Wait a minute. We need to go back and visit some of these churches and find these miraculous gifts. Because they are supposed to be confirmed until the end end. Isn't that right, Daniel? They're supposed to be confirmed until the end of time. Yet, they cannot, they put the gifts in the first century, but they want the righteousness in the 21st. They put the gifts in the first century, but they want to be confirmed until the um, day of Christ. They want the day of Christ in the 21st.